everyone. I'm Steph and that's Lisa together with Jenny. We're PD Connect. Thank you so much for being here. We have Dr. Jay Alberts with us. I'm going to read a little bit of an intro and then he'll get started. Dr. Alberts' research is focused on understanding the effects of neurological disease or injury on motor and cognitive function and developing disease specific interventions to improve motor and cognitive performance. He has worked extensively with individuals with Parkinson's disease patients with stroke, along with professional athletes and service members with concussion. He has worked extensively in the development of exercise programs for individuals with Parkinson's disease, which we love. He founded Pedaling for Parkinson's and has worked to establish more than 125 Pedaling for Parkinson's programs across the North America, primarily in the YMCA's and community centers. Welcome back. Thank you so yeah. much for being here. We have been talking about this for Months. Months. And if we were to Pretty list different. all of Dr. Albert's accomplishments and achievements, we'd be here till tomorrow. Till tomorrow. So could, without further ado. We could list them all on, a, uh, on the back of a, a, a matchbook, so. I don't think so. Don't It'd think be so. a pretty big matchbook. Okay, that yeah. said, enjoy everyone. And please, again, put your questions in the chat. Thank you for being here. Excellent. Well, hey, thanks so much for having me back, Steph and, and uh, Lisa. Um, Great to see you guys again, and uh, as always, great to see the tandem uh, in the background as well. Uh, it's fantastic. So uh, really appreciate it. So to, you know, normally I talk about uh, exercise, and so today we're going to talk a little bit uh, about some other things that we're doing in terms of technology and how do we use technology to better understand Parkinson's and to better understand the treatment of Parkinson's. So we'll go through a few studies in my lab, but again, this is definitely, at the end, definitely ask questions. And I think what hopefully at the end you'll see is that we're trying to use technology to better understand the disease and better you know, create better treatments. Um, and a critical component of that technology development, if anything is gonna work, is participation in research and clinical trials uh, to help us inform, inform the, uh, how the technology is developed and what it looks like. And I'm sure everyone has, uh, well, most people, you probably have a smartphone and uh, you know, I'm sure there are times where it's frustrating. I mean, we even see it sometimes with, with the Zoom, uh, right? It's uh, frustrating. So hopefully if we can, you know, our goal is to work with individuals with Parkinson's to create technology one, that is effective in treating some of the symptoms, and two, uh, is something that people will use. So with that, again, just a little bit of a uh, you know, summary. I mean, many of you probably already know this, uh, but this is relevant just about Parkinson's disease. It's about a million patients worldwide or in the US, five to seven million or so in uh, the whole uh, world. Uh, very expensive to treat. So this is the typical little cartoon of Parkinson's, right? So if you think about here, you know, Parkinson's affects your uh, substantia nigra, right? These are cells that produce dopamine. So what happens over time is if, well, first of all, if everyone lived till we were 125 years of age, we would all get Parkinson's or something like it, right? So, but something happens here as you're going along and you 50s, 60s, uh, something happens, and you have this rapid decrease in Parkin or in uh, dopamine, and it's right here at this point where you've already lost 60 to 80 percent of your neurons that you start to see the clinical symptoms. You know, uh, you know whether it's tremor or um, you know bradykinesia or rigidity or or, or whatever. It's typically seen 60 to 80 percent of the neur after 60 to 80 percent of the neurons are already gone, and so the problem with that is, and I think we've done a lot of good things with exercise, deep brain stimulation, medication, etc. To you know what we're really looking at is how can we then flatten this loss, right? How can we slow the loss of these neurons um, after this point? So one of the things that we've been working on and trying to use technology is. How can we potentially, if, if we think exercise is effective, tandem cycling is effective, which we know it is, how can we potentially do that earlier or with people earlier in the disease? In order to do that, we have to be able to reliably identify the disease earlier, right? So our real fundamental goal is how do we use technology 
to start to identify individuals who are at risk for Parkinson's disease before they go to the neurologist and the neurologist tells them they have, have Parkinson's. So that's what we're gonna be talking a little bit about today. Um, again, you probably have all seen this. This is just the, the classic uh, James Parkinson's essay on a shaking palsy. Um, you know, very classic uh, characterization of the four typical uh, clinical symptoms, bradykinesia, the rigidity or the cogwheeling effect, uh, akinesia, difficulty initiating movement, tremor, and then also postural instability and gait dysfunction. This is one that gets a lot of attention, but so far it hasn't been treated very well uh, through traditional means. So what are some of our current challenges and big uh, issues? Well, again, as we talked about a little bit before, uh, disease identification and progression of the disease. So you think of, you know, when I showed that figure there, it had the, uh, the gray area, trying to identify it before it happens clinically, that would be a prodromal marker. So we're looking for a marker that comes before the onset of the disease. Uh, and then once the disease does happen, we, what we don't have now very well are reliable biomarkers. So I'm sure many of you have gone to your neurologist and you do things like this or things like this or, or whatever, or even nose to, to chin or nose to nose, whatever, nose to finger. Those are fine. The problem is that's a bit of, so engineering background, right? So any, if there's any other engineers in the audience, you can appreciate this. The signal to noise ratio for those types of measures is not so good, right? There's a lot of noise because you think about if I was watching you do that, and let's say Lisa was watching you do that, we might rate, I might rate you a two, Lisa might rate you a one. And so that's a problem when you start looking at these measures over time and within an within a individual, because if it's not a very uh, robust measure, then we can't track the disease very well. Why do we want to track the disease? Well, we want to see if the disease is progressing. Is it progressing faster or slower? Is this medication having a positive effect, a negative effect? Should we change your medication? Uh, is the exercise uh, effective or not? So these are all things that we need to be thinking about and why it's important to be able to uh, better track the disease and create these different uh, biomarkers and, and prodromal markers. The other big thing that's, that's really big for me in my lab is how do we effectively treat gait and postural instability? So right now about 80% of individuals with Parkinson's, they experience a fall during, you know, as a result of this instability. Uh, this is a big deal. Falls are, you know, as many of you know, better than, better than me. You, you have a fall and it can, you know, you break a hip and that can really change the course of your, uh, your your life in terms of you know being independent or moving to a dependent care setting um and so that's one of the things we're really trying to understand and you think about it most people don't just fall they're not just standing there waiting for an elevator and then they fall right many falls happen while you're doing something else right you're involved engaged cognitively while you're walking or maybe you're distracted and so you trip over something, right? So that is a, a very strong sort of connection between cognitive function and motor function, right? This is, you know, sort of the, the classic, here's a little bit of the, uh, the uh, you know, patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time, which I won't do here for fear, I'll, uh, I won't be able to do it. But, but that's really what we're talking about here, right? There's a lot of activities like that, right? So in Cleveland, where we just had 14 inches of snow, I'm walking across the street, avoiding snow, avoiding a pothole, uh, while simultaneously looking to see if a car is coming and can I make it uh, in time? And is there ice there that I need to avoid? So that's a very complex situation, right? I have to you know, process a lot of information. So that's really what we're trying to do and think about ways that we can do that safely in the lab because right now it's very difficult to, to trigger uh, postural instability or freezing of gait when you go to your uh, physician uh, because most of our offices are 
right? They're nice and clean, they're nice and white, they have no uh, distractions in them. Uh, and that's not where you live. That, I'm just seeing some of the backgrounds. You And I don't see people living in, uh, well, I guess your room, Lisa, is very uh, clean, very, uh, it has something on the wall, but that's about it. But uh, you're, I would say that's the exception. Um, and that's not where people live, right? And so that's what we're trying to do is trying to figure out how do we better create environments and really technology, use technology to, to, to help uh, create those environments. So let me just talk a little bit about one of the things that we're looking to, to replicate. These are called instrumental activities of daily living. So there's a lot of data out there to suggest that you know, these activities, which you see on the right side of the screen, like cooking, house cleaning, taking your medication, laundry, shopping, et cetera, uh, transportation, these are very important. And they're actually very predictive in terms of who may have or may eventually be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Also, if we can measure them, could improve the uh, management of Parkinson's, whether it's medication or deep brain stimulation. Um, and such. So, but it's typically kind of difficult to evaluate these in a, in a clinical environment. Normally, you would have to go to an occupational therapist, they would have to have a specialized kitchen or something, and they would set you up and you know, they would watch you make some tea and toast or whatever, uh, fake bread and whatever. And so, the challenge with that is not a lot of places have the fake kitchen or those types of resources to. Uh, to gather that information. And you need a occupational therapist. So overall, it takes about 60 to 80 minutes. And so the problem is it will just never get integrated into clinical workflows. So what we're trying to do is to really come up with technology. So we're using, that would help solve this issue. We're using two types of technology, augmented reality and virtual reality. So augmented reality has been around for a while. It's an interactive experience where digital objects are placed in your environment. So what does that mean? Well, if anyone has ever had a, a car that has a, has a heads up display, so when you look through the windshield, you can see what your speed is, that would be augmented reality, right? They're taking a digital object, your speedometer, and putting it on the windshield, right? So a digital object in your uh, physical real world. Now, the other one is virtual reality. Virtual reality is a little different in the sense that, as you can see on the lower right there, that person has goggles on as well, uh, but they're fully immersed in that digital environment. So that person sees nothing else and, and really knows nothing else of what's going on except the giant apple or tomato in the, the warehouse there. Right, so they're very immersed, that's all they see. So two different types of technology. Um, again, we are, are looking at virtual reality. I'll talk a little bit about both, but virtual reality, you know, there was a challenge in 2008 to integrate this into clinical care. And so far I would say we haven't done a very good job. And one of the reasons we haven't done a good job is the, the locomotion problem, right? So when you are on a treadmill, a regular treadmill, you know, it can move in the linear way, linear direction, and that's great. Uh, but when you're in the real world, you don't just walk in straight lines, right? And then turn and things like that, right? You're walking in angles and curves and everything else. And so what happens is when you're in a virtual environment uh, is, and I don't know if anyone's ever been in a virtual environment, but people get sick, right? They get nauseated because you see all this virtual reality things going around. So I don't know if you've ever been to, to the mall and you can be in one of those uh, you know, virtual uh, roller coasters of sorts uh, or different things. But what happens is you have all this visual information coming in and just like you would when you walk or something, but you don't have the same proprioceptive or sensory information coming from your feet, right? You're just standing there. And so that causes people to get sick. So, you know, within 10 minutes, people are, you know, getting sick and not being able to use technology. So what we've done 
is we've, I think we've really overcome that. And with the way we've overcome it is using something called an omnidirectional treadmill. So again, for all the engineers uh, in the talk uh, here, you'll be happy to hear about this and we can definitely talk more about it because I think it's super cool. But this is a treadmill that basically has, you know, it's a treadmill on top of a thousand treadmills. So it has both the linear component, so it can go in one direction, but it also underneath there has a rotational component. So it's a rotary. So it can, uh, it allows you to actually um, move in any direction. And so I'll show you a little bit of that, um, but it's a really neat thing where if you start walking in one direction, the belt and the whole surface moves in the opposite direction. So in this case here, what's happening is we're trying to keep the individual in the middle of the treadmill, right? And so if they take a step this way, the treadmill will move the opposite way. So it's really trying to keep the person in the middle. It's a, it's a very elegant system. And I could go on for hours to talk about it, but, uh, but I'll save you. Um, so here is an example of what we're doing in our, in my lab, uh, it's called a, a V-gate, right? The virtual gate uh, trainer and assessment. And so here's sort of a cutaway of the, uh, <laughs> excuse me, the omnidirectional treadmill. And so what we've done is since we've solved this locomotion problem, we can now have someone actually walk through a virtual environment. So we developed a virtual grocery store. And what we have individuals do, similar to the grocery store that you go to, we have you walk through the uh, walk through the store and grab items off the shelf physically, grab the, well, you grab a virtual item, grab it, and you put it in the cart and it records that you have taken the item. And, and then you can even check it off your list. Uh, and so it's a very realistic task. And we are starting to look at this more and more in terms of we're actually integrating it into clinical workflows at the Cleveland Clinic because we want to see how well people perform sort of, sort of in the real world, right? So it's a better measure of how well your medication's working, how well your deep brain stimulation may be working. And, and I'll really go back to probably uh, more than a decade ago is sort of the motivation for it because I was once walking with an individual with Parkinson's disease who had deep brain stimulation. And I said, uh, yeah, hey, Bob, uh, you know, where are you from? And tell me about your family and, and such. And he said, okay, um, but we gotta stop because I really can't talk and walk and answer complex questions at the same time because of my DBS. And so, and we know that, right? We know that DBS sometimes causes um, cognitive difficulties. So we've been working on minimizing this, but this to me is a program or a software that we could potentially use to help uh, better program deep brain stimulation uh, individuals. Here is, again, as I talked about before, it's kind of hard to induce someone to freeze, right? So people generally freeze when they're overwhelmed with information, right? It's just too much information. Uh, or when they have some level of anxiety. So this is our version of trying to create some uh, anxiety. So this is a grant that was just funded by the Fox Foundation. And, and I'll tell you, you guys are lucky or maybe unlucky. Uh, this is the first time I have ever showed this and we're gonna show this to NIH and others. Uh, so you have a sneak peek. So this is someone walking through the kitchen and so again, this is virtual reality. So all they see is the kitchen and the kitchen island and some beautiful art. And then the door opens. And the idea is that it's supposed to make them anxious that they now have to walk this plank. Uh, and so it gives them a sense of you know, height and walking on a very narrow surface. And so the idea is, can we potentially induce uh, freezing or something there? And if we do, what we're doing for the Fox Grant is we're actually recording from the brain while they're doing this. And if we can identify the neural signature, so what's happening in the brain exactly when they freeze, then we can actually start to stimulate to overcome or to change those uh, patterns, those, those abnormal patterns of activity. So we can, I'll poll the group later to see if anybody was actually scared or had any anxiety. Uh, and if not, I would be happy to uh, take any suggestions that would make it uh, 
uh, more anxious. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is the interference. So again, many people, when they have uh, freezing of gait, they tell us that as they transition from an area with wood to some other type of flooring, that they have some freezing or going through a doorway. So we have the same kind of thing here where they have to transition from wood to uh, sort of slate and then make a tight turn back there. Uh, the other one is people talk about they're overwhelmed with information. They, they freeze because their, their husband or their wife was talking to them, the TV was going and they had to figure out what ingredients they needed for their recipe. So we try to replicate that. We can't have husbands and wives yelling at uh, each other here. So what we do is we created a, a situation where they're walking around this kitchen and occasionally an item will flash in front of them. And in this case, it is what you would call an incongruent, right? So if everyone sees this, uh, normally you would look at this and we would say, what, what animal is this? And so it's definitely not a chicken, right? It's a bee. So what, what you have is you have to process it and say, oh, wait, is it a bee or a chicken? And then you have to think about it a little bit. And so over time, those kind of add up and kind of increase the difficulty of the task. So the, again, the idea there is that we can potentially use this to uh, increase the difficulty or cognitive requirements of a task and then potentially identify when someone is freezing and we can change it if we can record it or see it. Uh, here is another, uh, here's the, the grocery shopping task. Here's an individual with Parkinson's uh, doing the task and he's walking through and we've uh, built the Cleveland Clinic shopping task and grocery store here. And this is another, we tried to make it sort of real life, right? So you're walking through the grocery store and you know, many people would tell us that they would freeze uh, if the aisle became narrow or if they had to go around someone uh, or between something. And so we tried to, we you know, made these virtual obstacles, two other people standing there looking for some, some other groceries and some boxes there. So, so again, we're doing this study now. Uh, it's a, a some person has to walk about a hundred yards or so through the grocery store and, and get these different, uh, different uh, objects or items. So again, here's just some of the data and I won't, uh, won't bore you, I'll skip through that. But here's one that, you know, is just an example of what we're really trying to do in terms of, you know, improving gait. So this is someone walking, individual with Parkinson's. So notice they, they have kind of a short arm swing, their hands aren't moving very much, their arms aren't moving, short steps here, okay, now, <clears throat> this person over here, same person, this is after they had undergone eight weeks of this uh, multimodal cognitive uh, physical therapy. And so you can see they're walking faster, their arm swings moving, their arms are moving a little bit better, um, and they just generally have a better gait. So our goal was to think about, well, how do we how do we do something like that? So we, we already showed that it was very beneficial in terms of one-on-one -on -one physical therapy with a PD patient. But again, I'm from a very tiny town in Iowa, right? We don't have a bunch of uh, physical therapists around and access to physical therapy is limited. So how do we take something like this and put it into some digital sort of package or some technology? Well, we, again, got a grant from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to do this, and it was really, the idea was that we were going to create a digital therapeutic. How do we take a technology and create this digital uh, therapeutic? So, again, this is our whole ecostructure or, or the ecosystem of, of what it is. I won't bore you there. Um, but this is really our therapist of sorts. So this is, uh, uh, her name is Donna named her after my mother um, and it was she guides the individual with Parkinson's through uh, the different activities right so in this case we're uh, asking them to make sure they're taking long strides right and so she'll be there to guide and she'll come up on the screen again the, the HoloLens so now we're using augmented reality uh, or she'll have them and, and we'll instruct them to move side to side get your arms up or make sure, I'm sure some of you have taken 
uh, different uh, gait training, you know, swing your arms, get them to move, or she will help people you know, navigate, get step over the obstacle. Um, so this has been how we've been really you know, delivering this digital therapeutic to uh, individuals with Parkinson's. And I will say that the one good thing of the pandemic is that we were able to put a mask on her because it's very difficult to get an avatar, a digital avatar to speak uh, and have the lips match the words that are coming out. So, so that was very helpful. Um, and here is just, again, an example of what someone sees. Again, see how this is in a gym and they're going through a doorway. I'm not sure if you could hear that, but Donna said, remember to take long steps and walk around the obstacle. So they're moving, going around here. And so again, the idea here is that we're giving people practice and sometimes we'll have it a little more difficult, <clears throat> excuse me, and ask them questions or spell a word backwards, right? So we want them to spell the word cat backwards, right? So what we're doing is we're training both their cognitive functioning um, and their, their physical functioning. But we're also training them together, right? So they can do two things at once. <clears throat> and you know, that's been very, very helpful for us. So I will, this is just visualization, but in this to me is, you know, and then I'm almost done, but this is the important part. So if you think about, this is the average number of falls that uh, our patients are having on in a 30 day uh, time period. So 1.5 to one. So those patients who are using the digital uh, technique that I, that I talked about just a little bit ago while they're walking through that obstacle course and practicing with Donna, those individuals are starting out at 1.5 falls a month and they're cutting their number of falls more than half. So they're you know, under one fall a month by the end of the trial after eight weeks. So we're very encouraged by this because the, another group of patients about the same, they're randomized, these people are going to a physical therapist and the same physical therapist who delivered the trial in our previous study is delivering it now. And what they are showing is really a little bit of a decrease during physical therapy and that holds a bit, but then four weeks and eight weeks after the trial is over, they're back to their baseline. So we haven't changed things from a, in a level of permanence, right? That's what we're looking for when we have these types of interventions, right? You don't just wanna have something happen and then uh, have it uh, go back the way it was, right? You want to have some permanence there. And so we're very encouraged by this red line showing that the, the technology group is actually doing better and they're maintaining their uh, fit or their uh, level of functioning in the sense that they're not falling. So again, we're very encouraged by that. And uh, you know, this is sort of where we're going next. You know, we're, we're starting to take the grocery store task and we're actually going to integrate that into clinical uh, work uh, to better understand how we can, if we can identify uh, individuals with Parkinson's earlier. Um, and we're also, as I talked about with the, uh, the virtual home environment, we're gonna start using that to tune deep brain stimulation parameters. Uh, and then I'm very excited about the, uh, the DART, the dual task augmented reality test that I just showed you, uh, where we had an improvement and a sustained improvement. So we're gonna take a larger trial there and we'd love to do an at-home trial because yeah, that's where I think it needs to go, right? I'm in a small town in Iowa, I need to get this or whatever. Um, and I don't have access to a, to a therapist. So, so that's, Lisa, that's all the slides I have. Um, and happy to answer questions about this or uh, anything else that I can. Thank you so much, Dr. Alberts. That is fascinating stuff. Um, can we be one of those at home places? <laughs> For, for sure yeah absolutely like, how we're, do i get one of those treadmills? we're gonna That's sign cool. you up and we're gonna have all of our people in the area <laughs> try them out and work with it and and send you the data there you go. yeah no that would be fantastic excellent cool. so we do have some questions let's take a look at the chat and if anyone if you want to type in your questions that you have um, one question is what happens if you run into a solid object in vr 
Yeah, that's a great question. And so when, again, because you're immersed into it, uh, you basically go through the object, right? So if you went through, so we have a, uh, um, a deli, right? With a guy back there cutting salami. And if you walk through the him and the deli, then you just go into a big white space. Um, so. Excellent. Okay. Very cool. Any other questions? If you don't know how to use the chat. We have you... another question. Do you want okay. to that? Um, yeah. Well, you had said you've been working all across the U.S. with the YMCA. That was actually for the pedaling for, for Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, are there any facilities that are using the DART right now or this kind of uh, not not AR. yet, not yeah. yet. We are just finishing the clinical trial, and so we are working on submitting a uh, a larger trial, and also working with any therapists around who would who would be interested in you know, <laughs> in the er in the early adopter phase, right? <laughs> Knowing that it's uh, early early technology, so you know there will be some bugs, but yeah. Oh, cool. they were actually asking about pedaling for Parkinson's. Oh, like. yes, I, yeah, I have the chat. Um, you know, I don't know exactly, um, but the best thing to do would be to go on the website, and I'll type it here as well, um, and yeah, as you, can as put in your, no, you can put in there. your uh, zip code, and that will find the, the uh, location closest to you, just through a quick search. Excellent. Thank you. And yes. then Nancy Christie's asking, how do you get involved in a trial? Ah, that's a great question. So I think the, the first thing to do is you can go to, there is a, uh, uh, the Fox trial finder on the Michael J. Fox uh, website. And again, put your address in or your area that you want to, you know, be involved in. And it will, it's a great search engine for a, a, a trial finder. The other thing is when you visit your neurologist, right? Uh, or your movement disorders neurologist, ask them if there's any clinical trials that you may be uh, eligible for. You know, you think about it, and I, and I would say that, you know, you guys are well poised uh, to participate because you have a great history of Parkinson's in the Bay Area. So there is a guy, if anyone know uh, Bill Langston? Um, yes. Yeah, so Bill Langston uh, is, you know, the ultimate, uh, because of just science and research, uh, and and you know, critical component in terms of, of developing models for Parkinson's. So yeah, definitely, uh, um, yeah, reach out to your neurologist. Ah, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so I, I'm seeing things here. Beat Saber. Sorry, I don't mind. Do you want? Do you want to read the questions, or I can read them? Either, yeah, either way, yeah. You yeah, can yeah I can read them. Yeah, so uh, great question about um, uh, Beat Saber because uh, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so we have actually absolutely talked about this. So Beat Saber is a virtual reality game where different things are coming at you and you have these sabers you have to cut them or whatever. It's like Fruit Ninja, if any of your grandkids or something or played uh, that game on the iPad. And so uh, yeah, we have definitely looked at that. And so what we've also thought about uh, is integrating, right? In that game right now, most of the things come to you, but we were, we are going to be integrating it so you can actually be walking around on a special sort of uh, omnidirectional treadmill as well. That's a little smaller than, than the one we have. But I think it's great that uh, folks are looking at these things. Um, and then Nancy has to follow up she meant, uh, oh, a trial where we're doing the virtual stuff. I'm sorry. Uh, at the moment, we're just doing them in Cleveland, but we are very close to uh, getting some other sites up and running. Um, and so I can't reveal the names of those sites yet because uh, they're not finalized. But once they are, I will definitely let uh, uh, Lisa and Stephanie know. But if you happen to have deep brain stimulation, and you happen to want to come to Cleveland for a trial, reach out. And I'll definitely, because uh, we have a trial that's ongoing right now, um, for sure. Uh, okay, the dopamine, uh, the dopamine motor neurons that are dying, but using this technology, see improvement. How does that work in a simplified way? 
Okay, great question. This is from Kathy. So we clearly are not um, probably, there's a, there's a very good chance we are not uh, facilitating the growth or the regeneration of dopamine neurons, especially with this. Now we might be doing that a little bit with the cycling, right? Uh, with exercise, because there's some data to suggest that. Here, what we um, think, what we think is happening is that what we're doing is improving the efficiency in the motor and the cognitive processing of the remaining neurons. And we're also sort of sharpening, if you will, sharpening their ability or tuning their ability, better tuning their ability to do this dual tasking or this dual processing. Um, so that's what we think is happening. Um, but again, we're, we're gonna keep looking to see you know, exactly and you know, doing some more imaging studies as well to see well, how the brain is actually changing. Um, all right, so Lucia uh, asks, so doing more than one thing at a time is more helpful than say walking and nothing else? Uh, great question um, or statement. I would say yes, but what I don't want you to do is to be distracted and trip over something and fall, right? So only doing these things in a very, very safe environment, right? So we never brought people outside and, um, and had them do dual tasking, right? We did it in a gym or a track, somewhere where it's safe. And we had a very structured uh, situation there. So I would encourage you to, um, to really, you know, if you are want wanting to do that, simple things like, you know, if you have a, a safe area, maybe a track or something, that you can walk on safely and you know, start at 85 and count backwards by sevens. Um, and then do another lap without doing that. Uh, and then just, just alternate. And then um, you know, that, that could be a way to, to help. And you're doing it in a very safe way. Uh, right, let's see. Any updates on TheraCycle? Ah. TheraCycle uh, was recently purchased by a new, has new ownership. And uh, I am actually in conversations with those guys right now talking about, could we have, is there some way we can think about creating a new uh, TheraCycle that would replicate what we've done on the tandem bike? So, so more to come on that. Uh, okay, great question from Richard. Um, how will this trial uh, help to identify Parkinson's disease earlier in the disease progression? So this trial itself won't, but the other trial that I was talking about, or the other pilot will. So what we're planning to do, Richard, is we will take the virtual grocery store and we're going to put a small treadmill in the um, doctor's office or a primary care physician who sees primarily uh, healthy older adults. Um, anywhere from say 55 to 65, right? So the idea is then we will track their performance over time. And if, because what we know is that that is a sort of a telltale sign of early Parkinson's if their performance decreases. It's kind of similar to, um, I'm sure many of you have you know, know this, uh, that you know, if you ask, if someone asked you what were some of your early signs, you might say, um, <clears throat> uh, well, I couldn't smell, right? I lost the, I had the loss of smell or constipation. Uh, and so we can still ask those questions. People ask those questions all the time, but they're really not thought of like, they, they just sort of get brushed away and say, well, that's just part of aging or whatever. And you should, uh, you know, I don't know, eat more, fiber or something, right? Those are, those are things, right? And so they're sort of ignored. And so we hope to really raise the level of awareness here. So people are actually looking for neurological disease. Uh, and so we can identify it earlier. All right. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too long to answer these questions. Uh, all right, if you have DBS and want to reach out to me to, but I'm sure, how do we, okay, I will put my email in the uh, in the chat, and anyone can send me an email about any of this or anything else. All right, 
Uh, when freezing during virtual reality exercise, can you tell where in the brain? Oh, exactly. That's exactly. So Linda, great question. That's exactly what we're looking at doing here is identifying where that freezing is coming from, what part of the subthalamic nucleus, that's where, you know, where the, the electrode is in. And if we can identify uh, what part it's in and what, the, what those squiggly lines that neural activity looks like, then when we put that electrode in, we can change it. We can make it more normal. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do. And so, you know, again, uh, hopefully come back in a year or so and we'll be able to talk about it in much more detail, but I'm super excited about it. Ah, best question of the day. Uh, where in Iowa is Dr. Alberts from? I am from uh, Sanborn, Iowa. It is a village of about 1,200 people, uh, probably 25 miles uh, south of uh, Minnesota and 35 miles from the South Dakota border. Um, it's, uh, it was a great place. It's, I, it's idyllic. Love it. Um, all right. Do you use dual task on the tandem? That's a great question. Um, we generally don't, but you definitely are, if you're ever riding, certainly if you're ever riding a tandem outside, um, then you're very much dual tasking because you're doing the, the motor activity as well as processing and, uh, Lisa and Steph, I don't know if you guys ever ride outside, um, but if you do, you're processing a lot of information. Is this car going to stop? Is this car going to hit me or what? So, uh, all right, let's see. Went on to the pedaling Parkinson site. No sites in the Bay Area. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. If you want to start a PFP, uh, reach out. Send me an email at my email down there and we'll get you hooked up. The other neat thing about it is I run, the, it's a nonprofit, right? And so what we do is we also help set up sites. So if your site needs a little uh, funding or something or a bike and they need some money for it, let me know and we'll be able to, uh, to help you out there. Because that's really our whole goal, right? Is to, to push this because, you know, the whole reason we went across Iowa, you know, what, oh, geez, almost 20 years ago, is to raise awareness for Parkinson's and to let people know that it, it's you know not a death sentence. And, and then after we saw that and the great effects of exercise, it was like, well, we can't just do these clinical trials. We have to take this information and translate it out there. Um, because you know, people talk about translational work, but, and they say it's from the bench to the bedside, but typically or often what happens, it's, it's the bench to the bookshelf, right? And someone reads about it and it never actually happens. And so we really wanted to uh, you know, start these pedaling for Parkinson's programs in the places where people needed them. Uh, so yeah, definitely reach out. We'll be happy to, to help you in any way we can to get it started and provide just expertise as well as some financial support. So thank you. Yeah, actually, Lisa and I are getting certified right now, um, not through pedaling for Parkinson's, but we'd love to connect with you because we'd like to get something oh, for started. Sure for our own program. We did reach out initially uh, and then just, yeah. yeah, we'll be following up with you about oh, that. Oh, for sure, yeah, definitely reach out. And I apologize, it, it's- No, uh, not if, at all. Yeah, if you did reach out- No, 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 it, no, no. It was, I think her name is Nancy. We, we've, yeah, and she has the oh. contract and all that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, she had DBS and yeah, so, okay, yeah. But reach, definitely reach out. We, I just got a, I just started another site today down in Cincinnati, sure. so. Yeah, so we, we would love something like that, a little bit different in our area, and we recognize that. So, and that's also fun for us. So it's something yeah, we, we for wanted sure. to add fun. to our program yeah. as well. Anyway, that's great. Thank you so much. Good question. Yeah. I just have a comment, which is, well, you know, we talk a lot about exercise as medicine and exercise for brain change. And it looks like from your slides that using this AR or VR is also able to create some brain change. Can you just comment about how this is not necessarily a replacement for exercise? Or oh yeah, for sure. No, I don't think it's a replacement at all. I think what it is, is for some folks who, especially those individuals who are fallers, uh, it will attack something that is very likely causing falls, right? And that's the ability to process a cognitive thing, uh, process information and 
walk at the same time without falling. Uh, and so it's just giving that practice. And quite, quite frankly, it's very similar to, uh, it's sort of a cognitive motor exercise. So I, I would definitely not recommend it in lieu of one or the other. I think it's really, they work together, right? So, you know, that, that's, the, that's the problem with people like me and scientists, right? We, we never get grants funded. Grants would never get funded if we tried to do exercise plus the, the augmented reality. Everybody wants to look in these things in a very isolated silo. And that's good for science, but, but at the same time, it makes it difficult um, uh, you know, to, to say what you should be doing. So, so I fully appreciate that. Uh, George, let's see, would it be helpful for someone who has not fallen yet, but absolutely, but help uh, basically to prevent falls? Absolutely. And that's where I was telling, thinking maybe Robin or Lucinda uh, or Lucia, Lucia, uh, doing these things, even if you're not a faller, it would be great, right? I would you know, obviously fully recommend the, the exercise, but uh, doing this type of mental cognitive and motor thing at the same time would be great. And it, uh, it likely would uh, reduce rate of falling um, or even slow the time to which it, which it starts or prevent it. So I would definitely do that. But again, do it safely, right? So be, make sure you're in an area that's safe and you can you know, go on a track and you know count backwards or do something like uh, uh, you know, spell different, you know, three letter words backwards and then think of four letter words and then spell those backwards, you know? So, but, but safety is the key here. All right, I do not see any other questions in the chat. George just typed something else there. Oopsie, oh, I lost sorry. my chat. Our son has just started oh. playing games, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Playing games with the headset you showed us and thought it would be. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Again, you have to be safe, right? The, the key, some, the challenge sometimes with the uh, virtual is when you go into your house, uh, and I don't remember who asked the question before, is what happens when you walk through solid objects. In your house, what happens when you walk through solid objects or think that you're hitting something, you could hit the wall, right? So if you want to if you enjoy the vintage America's Funniest Home videos from the 80s, uh, go on YouTube and Google virtual reality fails. And you'll see people walking into walls, falling all over things and such. So yeah, so just be careful. I have just what uh, George is talking about. It's called the Oculus and it's a VR system. And it makes you create what they call the guardian. It's the safe space. So it'll kind of vibrate and show you that you're walking through the area you're not supposed to. Well, at first I didn't know what it, you know, that it was telling me that <laughs> I just kept swinging and hitting. And I knocked over a table with a puzzle with a thousand pieces and my air filter all at the same time. So nice. I was playing yeah. Beat Saber. That game <laughs> is the best. But anyway, so we, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, yes. A lot of those games are good for people with Parkinson's. Uh, as long as you're coming to completion, we often talk about that. When you're in a, when you're in a position with a headset and again, complete virtual reality, you don't get to see really what your arms are doing or what your feet are doing in that moment. And so I'm sure... Uh, what you guys have created is something amazing, and we can't wait to hear more about it. Um, exercise, um, Dean with the headband, Richard, is, is what it says there is exercises help what is happening with brain neurons to slow down Parkinson's progression. Exercises help. What is happening? Oh, I see, I see. No punctuation. Okay. What is happening with brain neurons oh. to slow down Parkinson's progression was Dean's question. Yeah. Great, great question. Still have lots of unanswered questions there, but uh, what we think is happening, and there's pretty good data to support this, is that what happens when you exercise, especially at a high intensity, is you have an increase in the quantity and the quality of your movement, right? And so you have these the sensory information that goes back to your brain, and, and it's going back there more regular in a more regular fashion as well. And so what we think is happening is that triggers something called these neurotrophic factors. Neurotrophic factors are simply proteins. So you think about if you're trying to 
build your muscles up and training and get big or whatever, you know, you increase your protein, right? And so that's the same kind of thing that we think is happening in the brain in the sense that this, these proteins are actually helping either slow the, the death of these neurons, the dopamine neurons in the brain, or they may actually be having some regeneration component. Um, and so that's, again, something that we're looking at and using some very sophisticated imaging to figure out exactly what's happening. But I think there's really good uh, animal data to suggest that that is, uh, is what's happening. Well, there you have it, folks. Another wonderfully informative session with Dr. Jay Alberts. That are there any more questions? Um, Sand, Sandy says that is the best news. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for your time. We're not going to take you over today. We really appreciate you being here again, uh, and we look forward to hearing more information about what's going on. Yeah, and being yeah. part of the uh, the dart or getting getting a some <laughs> AR into the West Coast for sure. Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, that would be fantastic. And so I really appreciate the invite. And and again, thanks everybody for sticking through it. I know this is a little different, probably than some of uh, certainly my other talks that are a little bit more directly applicable today. But I think again, this is something that uh, you know we're always thinking about uh, tomorrow as well. So. Um, thank you so much. And Lisa, Steph, you guys are doing a great job. And uh, were you actually really pedaling? Was there resistance? <laughs> well, yeah, I was you don't, you're complaining. She was complaining. I was sweating. I'm like, I'm sweating. <laughs> She's, she kept saying, I'm sweating. And I'm like, are we muted? <laughs> you know, it's always something. Anyway, yes. Well, thank you Very again good. so much. We All hope right. to be, yeah. Yeah, we, we had a great time. We, again, uh, we've got our tandem bike project. We hope that um, we'll be launching that. We'll be launching um, COVID hit right when it happened. We have four oh. tandem bikes we'd love to bring to areas new, uh, near you all, uh, wherever that may be. We have a van, we have bikes. Um, Anyway, that said, if oh, you don't yeah. know who we are, we're PD Connect, and we teach virtual exercise um, five days a week right now. Uh, we're looking to expand. Everything is virtual um, until we feel safer going out in the public, but we're happy to be here. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself and Lisa. It's great to see familiar faces and new faces. Um, we're all about exercise, and we love that. So thank you again, Dr. J. Alberts, for being here and taking the time to be here. We know that uh, it's later where you are. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's very good. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all. Have a great, all right. Night. All right. Have a great day. day. Thank you. you Have a great Bye -bye. evening. Bye.